You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hey gang, welcome to episode 247. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. of the Rusted Robot Podcast for Sunday, June 16th, 2019. My name is Optimus Prime. Hello, I am C-3PO, human cyborg relations. I am Locutus, a Borg. Resistance is futile. You're like a machine underneath, right? But sort of alive outside? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. You're not quite, uh... Human, are you? No, sir. I'm an android. These aren't the droids we're looking for. Counterfeit facsimile replica. We need some sort of robot. Ah, crap. I'm some sort of robot. What are your prime directives? Serve the public trust. Protect the innocent. Uphold the law. By your command. Hey, it's your regular hosts, Sean and Josh. How are you guys out there in podcast land? We hope you're doing fantastic for the middle of June. How are you? I am tired. Again? Yes. Or still? Uh, still. Yeah. Rough week, rough week. You've had a number of those, haven't you? Yeah. Well, well, work sucks. Maybe you need a new job? No, work sucks. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Oh, just work in general. Yeah. Well, you know what they say. If you find a job that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. That's a lie. I believe it is, too. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter what you love, if you work at it long enough, you're going to hate it. Suck it up and just get your paycheck, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and on that note, uh, work has sucked for me too, because it rained all week. Yeah. I, I was glad I didn't. I wasn't outside for most of the week. I think Tuesday and Friday were nice, and the rest were just pure rain. So, good times. Okay. Right. Well, good for the forest fires. Right, because there's a big, big forest fire out in Gogama. Go mm. Gamma. Go Gamma Go. Yeah, you know. I know. Yeah. Anyway, our listeners from around the world might not know where Gogama is. It's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> okay, go, go to Timmins. Yeah. So you're in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere already. And go more towards the middle. Yes. And there, there you'll find Gogama. Yeah. Yep, big giant forest fire, and they say it's out of control, but it rained for like a week, so I don't know why it's still out of control, but... Because once they're that big, it, uh, the rain doesn't get enough moisture down like it, it it evaporates before it even gets there well that and it gets to the ground like the fire gets into the roots oh yeah and it gets insidious yeah right so it's it's a hard time putting out a forest fire i would imagine yeah. yeah so it is forest fire season so there is that it's starting earlier every year mm -hmm. it's the end times josh the end times but we're not here to talk about depressing crap let's talk about something fun and exciting okay do you have anything? Uh, not really. This has been a quiet week. It has. There's, uh, there's really virtually no trailers to speak of. Nothing pop culture-wise. There was the trailer for uh, Angel Has Fallen, the third in the... Uh, has Fallen series. Right, with Gerard Butler. Yeah, as an American Secret Service agent. Yeah, it, it looks like a halfway amusing, diverting action film. Yeah. Without any consequence, or who cares? Uh, there was a trailer for something called The Dark Within, some kind of horror film, uh, some childhood trauma, maybe some ghosty type demon things. Yeah, I'm not sure whether that's a, that's a real psychological crazy or is that a real supernatural crazy. It was hard to tell from the trailer. Yeah. yeah. It might be good. Mm hmm. So. Uh, you were playing a trailer for Official Secrets or something? Yeah, that's, so. a, that's a movie for. Um, about the the Iraq War. Uh, historical buffs would love this. Yeah, it's, it's a historical thing set in England. Right. So, eh. No, no real trailers like, to play this week. They all look okay. Yeah, they're fine. They don't look... Ooh. No. None of them really grabbed. Nope. But they looked fine. Yeah, they looked all right. Uh, I was looking through the trailers and uh, for summer movies... The only thing coming up exciting is uh, Spider-Man Far From Home, yeah. uh, July 2nd, 
And then after that, there's really nothing for the rest of the summer. This is this is a barren summer. Everything was front loaded, and it was pretty much just Avengers Endgame. Well, yeah, well, that was kind of a big build up, right? It was. And then, like, Marvel's not really announcing anything yet. No, they're, they're trying to keep it hush hush for now, which is fine. Get the excitement back up. Get yeah. the speculation going. Mm-hmm. Steal as many ideas as they can from the fan base, and then keep going. Well, that's all they can do, really. Yeah. But but yeah, Disney has been pretty quiet ever since they uh, acquired Fox. There's been really no news coming out. Well, they're probably reorganizing, figuring out what they can do, what they can't do. That's what I'm thinking too. Yeah, I did see an interesting movie on Netflix yesterday. Which one was that? It's called The Wandering Earth. It was uh, a huge film in China this year. I, last time I read an article about it, it had made like six hundred million dollars in China. Okay. Uh, huge. And so Netflix acquired it, put it on their server without really saying much about it. I think we played a trailer a few weeks back, maybe. But I finally watched it. Weird. Uh, so the scenario is that uh, the sun is about to engulf the earth within 100 years. Okay. So For some reason. Sure. So it's an existential threat to humanity. So all the uh, governments of the world unite. Now we have the United Earth Government. And they've come up with a plan to uh, to save the Earth. And what they do is they build, I think maybe they said 10,000 Earth engines. So they have these giant fusion rockets uh, all around the equator and on one side of the Earth, I think it was. And um, they've built underground cities underneath the fusion rockets to protect most of humanity. So they've saved, I think, 3.5 billion people and the rest there's no room for so they all die but what they're doing is they're firing up the engines and they're taking the earth out of orbit and they're sending it 4.2 light years away to the next star and it's going to take them 2500 years to get there so they're gonna uh, fire these rockets they're gonna use uh, Jupiter's gravity to slingshot them out of the solar system and so everything goes fine 17 years later we're heading towards Jupiter, but there's a, a spike, and uh, all the engines are going offline, and the atmosphere is being ripped away, and all kinds of bad stuff. And so it's up to the team, uh, the son of the the astronaut hero who abandoned his son 17 years earlier to go up to the uh, the space station that was leading the Earth to find this. Uh, they called it a lighter core to get this one major super duper uh, Earth engine to shoot its flame at Jupiter to ignite Jupiter's hydrogen and send it off. Uh, oh. It was, um... All right, so... <laughs> it was ridiculous. So, I got a few few uh, questions on this. Go on. Okay, so, what's causing the Earth's atmosphere to be ripped off? Uh, the gravity of Jupiter is pulling Earth's atmosphere off of it. So, they had uh, these special suits that they could go outside up above the underground cities uh, to do work because they're they're, they're um, to feed the earth engines power they're scooping up mountains and stuff and they have these big giant trucks and they have airplanes but the airplanes all crashed because the atmosphere was too thin once they hit Jupiter's uh, gravitational pull so all the airplanes crashed and it was up to a few heroes to ignite this one engine so I got some problems with that. Okay. Since the Earth would be falling towards Jupiter. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. We'd be in free fall, which means we would be experiencing zero gravity, which means the atmosphere, no matter what would be happening with Jupiter, would stay on the Earth because it is part of the Earth's system and has experienced zero gravity in relation to Jupiter because we're in free fall around Jupiter as we're approaching it. Therefore, our atmosphere wouldn't be ripped off. Also... Igniting the hydrogen on Jupiter? To build a shock wave to push the Earth out of the way. So they just set it on fire? Well, it was just this localized explosion. They didn't set up the whole planet on fire. Okay. Just this one hydrogen pocket, I guess. And it uh, sent the shock wave towards Earth and it pushed it out of uh, the. Because okay. it was going to crash into Jupiter. That's some bad aiming. They, they should have been working on that aim for like 17 years. You know, we can do that now. Right. But Jupiter had a gravitational spike, which caused the Earth... A what now? A gravitational spike. You know, as one does. No! <laughs> a mass of a system is determined... Yeah, right. Exactly. Initially, like, to have a spike, mm -hmm. 
it, matter would have to suddenly appear. Okay. And then suddenly disappear. Uh huh. But whatever happened caused the Earth to be off of its uh, trajectory trajectory by nine point two degrees or something. So all the engines were failing, and there was earthquakes, and all kinds of stuff was happening. Why are the engines failing? I don't know. Because like. Okay, let's give them a gravity spike. Mm -hmm. Matter randomly assembled inside of Jupiter and then just vanished. Even though that doesn't happen. Okay. We'll give them that. We'll give them that. Okay. A weird quantum phenomenon, one in exapillion chance, but okay. Yeah. We'll give them that. Mm -hmm. Why are the engines failing? I'm sure they explained it, but... Because, like, we're in free fall again. Yes. So, so we are experiencing... Free fall, plus our engines giving us a little bit of uh, acceleration gravity. Yeah. All right. Now this counteracted by mostly by the mass of the Earth because we can't push the Earth that fast, but it's fine. Why are the engines failing? They're safely nestled inside of our perfectly safe atmosphere. Yeah. Wrapped right next to our nice solid planet. Mm -hmm. Why are they breaking down? They were just going offline. I wish I could remember why. I'm sure they explained it in the film. Okay, okay. But there was so much going on, that, and the dubbing was interesting, too. And, and nine degrees? I think 9.2 degrees off its trajectory. 9.2. You know, currently they're working with, like, six points, six decimals of accuracy right now. Uh -huh. At no point would it ever get nine degrees off trajectory before they go, oh, we should probably fix this. Because, like, that's that's a significant margin. Uh -huh. As soon as it started going off, they should have went, <gasps> we're going off target. Hey, guys, let's fix this before it becomes a problem. So this is, this is terrible. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, scientific things that didn't make a lot of sense. I wish I was watching it with you, actually. It would have been fun. But uh, also, all right, they, they could only save 3.5 billion people. Yeah. Um, why? Because they were building the underground cities... And there wasn't enough room in the underground cities five kilometers below the Earth engines uh, to house everybody, I guess. But why do you need to be five kilometers below the Earth engines? Because you're going to be on an intergalactic journey, uh huh. and there's no sun to warm your planet, so you need to be uh -huh. underground to protect yourself, I guess, maybe? You tr that No, that actually makes sense. That's perfectly fine. Okay. But why do you need to be underneath the Earth engines? Uh, because uh, it's the most stable spot, apparently. Underneath the mountains would do you just fine. I think that's where the Earth engines were, actually. Because they were actually digging up the mountains uh, to f fuel the fires. So, and what what are the... They're putting rock into the engine? Uh, to, that's the fuel, I guess? Yeah. I don't know. They just had a bunch of scenes of uh, big, gigantic scoops and, and transport haulers. Because, like, the, mo the most of your fuel yeah. is the ocean. You break off the oxygen... And you use the hydrogen to fuse in your rocket. Well, the planet was frozen solid because they yeah, were... yeah, break up the ice. Yeah, and break it up using your the excess energy from your fusion rockets. Mm -hmm. And if you have that power, it means you have the ability to be build fusion generators, which means you build a few smaller fusion generators. You can supply enough power for everybody on the Earth. You could have dug down. You could have saved ten times the world's population. Okay, because you just. You have a fusion rocket. It means you can just cut through columns of Earth, just uh, point it down, burn a hole a mile in, put off side tunnels, bam, there's a million people, move over a few miles, boom. Do it again. It, if you got a fusion, that solves a giant set of problems. You could have built a geodesic dome on the backside of the Earth. I didn't write the film. Well, I'm just saying, John, you should have done better. Yeah, I know, right? So, yeah, it was a 2,500-year journey. I think they were going to ignite the rockets for 500 years. Then they were just going to float on their inertia. And then for the last 700 years, they were going to retrofire them wait, wait, to wait. slow down. Wait, wait, wait. And then insert themselves into the orbit of the other star. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. So, you're using the rockets to stay warm. No, no. The rockets are to fire the... Yes, 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 yes. And you built your cities underneath them to stay warm. Yeah. But you're going to turn them off for a thousand years? Uh-huh. I guess the cities had their own power supplies, too, to keep them warm, too. But the but reason then, for being underneath the rockets, five miles down or five kilometers down or whatever, was for stability. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know. The Wandering Earth, Josh. It's on Netflix. 
Okay. Yeah. I, I highly recommend it to you because I would love to get your opinion on what you actually see. <sighs> it wasn't it wasn't bad. <laughs> and um so, so like the movie starts with a gimme. Every sci-fi film, you give them one or two gimmies. And this gimme... The sun is going to expand and... Uh, in only a hundred years. 300 years, the entire solar system is going to be gone. No. <laughs> but we'll give them the gimme that'll go out in a hundred years, and it will destroy the Earth's orbit. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. When it expands, it's, it's going to expand... Uh, take out uh, Mars. But it's not going to take out like the outer solar system. Oh, apparently it was. No. There was going to be no solar system left within 300 years. That's, that's not how the star's expansion would work. So let's use this, the Earth as a spaceship, put some rockets on it, and fire it, and take a 2,500-year journey. Yeah, but if you're going to do that, you, s you take the Earth out to an outer orbit, and you, just, you bring it out to an outer orbit, and you go, Hey, let's gather all the resources we could possibly use now that we have time. You could have just kept the Earth at an equidistance as the sun expanded if you got these kind of rockets. I guess there's that, isn't there? Right? Yeah. You keep the Earth just at a nice, habitable, comfy zone so everybody that can live on the surface still and not die. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you get, you start sending people out in spaceships to the outer systems to start gathering up as much resources as we can steal from, like, the asteroids and the Kuiper Belt. And we start building you giant spaceships. Uh -huh. And as you keep the sun going, we got 300 years of... All of humanity's effort, we got fusion rockets, we can build a whole fleet of O'Neill cylinders. What? An O'Neill cylinder? It's a cylinder, you, and you spin it up really fast, and it gives artificial gravity. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a spaceship design. Right, yes. Okay, I didn't know what it was called that. Okay, well, you, the O'Neill cylinders, and then you can, you can fill billions of people on those. So that's kind of what they build for, like, Babylon 5 gravity? What, what the big space Bat 1-5 is a, a O'Neill cylinder. Okay. Humans and aliens wrapped in 2,500,000 tons of spinning metal, all alone in the night. Except, for some reason, they have gravity on the upper decks when they shouldn't. Yeah. Because, like, the, the, the command bridge, which is just a spike sitting over top, yeah. looking at the thing, they shouldn't have gravity there. Huh. Maybe they have some artificial gravity. Who knows? I don't know. I didn't design these things. I have no idea. But that sounds like I need to do a Babylon 5 rewatch. Sure. But yeah. Okay. Like, there's, there's, there's just pushing the Earth all the way out? No, you don't do that. You convert the Earth. Uh, you know how much metal is in the Earth? How much metal? An Earth's worth! Probably. You take off the crust and you take off the water. Yeah. And then we have a giant ball of nickel iron. Oh, that's true. You just start scooping that up and forming it into spaceship hulls. Uh huh. That could work. You got fusion rockets. You can do a lot of shit. You can do a lot of stuff. Yes, yes, you can. Um, I'm just wondering if putting a bunch of rockets on the planet would actually move it. Uh, fusion candles, yeah, it would work. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You have to make them tall enough that the atmosphere is pretty thin above them. Mm -hmm. They were pretty tall. Uh, you can use that with active support systems. Okay. Um, and then you just fire the rockets. Although the rate of acceleration is all wrong. The, the rate of acceleration on Earth has to be really small. Yes. Because, you know, we're a planet. Well, it took 17 years to get to Jupiter's orbit. That's a really short amount of time. Is it? Yeah. Okay. I recommend you watching it and giving us a report. I think Earth's stability is like 0 0.04 g acceleration. Okay. Which would take years and years and years and years uh, to get anywhere. Probably, right? But, you know. It's a TV movie. It's a movie. Not a TV show. It's uh, a movie. It was fine. <sighs> okay. The, the, the effects were cool. Oh, that's fine. Like, I can still watch a dumb film mm -hmm. and be like, oh, that was cool. Yeah. Like, you know the movie The Core? Yeah. Completely ridiculous. Yes. Completely stupid. Quite. I enjoyed it. Uh -oh. Nice. Terrible movie. It is terrible. Bad, bad science. Yeah, totally bad. You know what now is a good time for? What's that? How about we play a promo for another podcast here on the ESO Network? Okay. This is Mandy from Caster Quest, and we're inviting you to join us as we explore Patrick Rothfuss's best selling fantasy series, The Kingkiller Chronicle. You can find Caster Quest at casterquest.com, on SoundCloud, on Apple Podcasts, or at our podcast network at esopodcast.com. Ambrose Jack is dumb, a loading on a date. 
Master Kilvin, old ass man, a selling lamps to folks in Emre Will and Sim and Deox Tension, Tabalin the Great. How did you like that promo? That was pretty good, right? Sure. Yep. Fantastic. <laughs> I knew you'd love it. All right. So, I guess what we could talk about now is uh, the Starfleet Delta symbol that they found on Mars. Okay. It's been all over the uh, the social media landscape. Rampant speculation. Now, how you close are... is it to the face on Mars? I don't know. They didn't say. And the pyramids of Mars? Couldn't tell you. And has John Carter been there? He has been there already. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, all over Facebook this past week, all the groups that I follow, they've been sharing and resharing this silly article that says, oh, look, the, uh, the Starfleet Delta symbol has been found on Mars. I guess Starfleet has some explaining to do. And uh, it's just a sand dune or a lava dune or something. And just the wind shaped it millions of years ago and it's still there. And it's cool. Yeah, it looks cool, but, you know, it's like the face on Mars. Turns out the face on Mars only happened because of the particular shadows, the way they fell that day with the wind and the sand had piled up in that particular way. Because when they went back years and later and they took another picture... Gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's in our instinctual brain from millions of years of evolution to see faces mm-hmm. and recognize patterns. Yep. So naturally, we're going to see stuff. Oh, yeah. But you, you, you're going to find that all over the earth, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, you do. Huh. You totally do. And like in tortilla chips. Yep. Also true. And looking at the, uh, the Starfleet Delta on Mars, there's an article on our Facebook page that listeners can go check Isn't it, it a bit wide from the yeah, picture I saw? Yeah. It's not as narrow as it should be. No, it's not a true delta. So it's just, it's just a, it's a similarity. A wedge. Yeah, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And, and which era of what, like, delta is it? Because, like, there's the original series that does not look anything like the, uh, the Voyager one. No, they're quite different. Yeah, so if you go to the Facebook page, it's actually the first article, and it just says, uh, NASA Orbiter spots Star Trek symbol on Mars, and it kind of looks like it, but it is too wide, and it it's it's like and an the A. the prongs are not long enough. No, they're not. So yeah, no, it's, it kind of looks like the original Series 1, but not quite. Not quite, but it's neat, I guess. Because yeah, sure, yeah. Whatever. All right. Looks so, cool. Looks cool, but that's about it. it. It's not really much of anything. Speaking of not much of anything in Star Trek... Yes. The Quentin Tarantino. Holy crap, buddy. Uh, all this week, every, every friggin' article site that I came across, uh, Tarantino confirms his Star Trek Four movie will be rated R. And then I've read the article, and there's... A script, apparently, that he hasn't read yet, he hasn't given his notes on because he's been too busy with uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, Paramount is excited about the film, but they haven't greenlit it or anything. We don't know who the cast is. Um, there's no nothing confirmed. So it's just tons and tons of articles about Tarantino's uh, new film and how it's uh, going to be rated R, but... Wait, they called it Star Trek Four. Yeah, they keep calling it Star Trek Four. So it wouldn't be Star Trek 4 if Tarantino is doing a reset, right? So mm-hmm. if it's a 4, then that, we know the cast already, because the cast would have to come back. And Carl Urban says he's maybe seen the script, and he's excited about it, but there's nothing confirmed anywhere. So this is just a bunch of padu, because one guy said, yeah, I, I'm excited about it. Pretty much, that's all there is about it, yeah. Hey, this is Dr. Trek, Larry Nimichek, and you're listening to The Rusted Robot with Sean and Josh and The Rust. Okay, so just to conf- to uh, go to the article itself, it says, Quentin Tarantino says his take on a Star Trek movie would be R-rated. Uh, he's spoken out about possibly taking on a direct- directorial role in the Star Trek franchise, saying that his take on Star Trek would be most likely R-rated. Speaking to Empire this week, he said that any Star Trek film he helmed would almost certainly be swear-laden. It's an R-rated movie. If I do it, it'll be R-rated. Asked about the progress on the Star Trek project, uh, he apparently pitched. Tarantino replied, there's a script that exists for it now. I need to weigh in on it, weigh in on it but I haven't been able to do that yet. So the prospect of a Tarantino-directed Star Trek movie has already been described as Bananas by Carl Urban. Uh, I know a little bit about what that is, and it's Bananas, Urban said last year. So they're waiting... 
So they are writing that as well. It's going to be a year away from finishing that, so it would be really rad to get to make a film with him, the actor added. That would be a dream come true. He is definitely an auteur. Whether you like his films or not, he's a good filmmaker, and he makes interesting stuff. So to me, that is when you get the best results. And uh, Simon Pegg wasn't as positive about this. He said uh, he believed the director would approach it with respect should he go ahead with directing the film. And that's all the articles say. That's the most information I found about all the sharing and everything. It's that, yeah, it's going to be rated R, and it might be cool, and it might not be, but he's a good filmmaker. So, nothing. Yeah, no news. Yeah. But it's been shared like a million times all over the place, and it's... So it shows hype for the, the franchise. Yes. Which is great. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy people being hyped for the franchise but they're not saying anything. A lot of non-news news articles. So, I don't know. Yeah, there's not a lot to say. But you know who does have a lot to say? Who's that? Paul Wright. Do you know who that is? I know Paul Wright. He's our UK correspondent. He is. He submitted quite the report this week. I think we should go ahead and play it. Hello, it's your UK correspondent, Furbob here, and welcome to the future. It's 2019, but sometimes it feels like our futuristic dreams are stuck in the 1950s and 60s, and there's actually a good reason for that. The period between 1958 and 1963 might be described as a golden age of futurism, if not the golden age of futurism. Book ended by the founding of NASA in 1958, and the end of the Jetsons in 1963, these few years were filled with some of the wildest techno-utopian dreams that American futurists had to offer. But how accurate were these predictions? And have any of them come true? In the 1950s, a magazine called Closer Than You Think was produced to show just what the future could look like. I have taken a number of their predictions to see whether any of them have actually come true or whether they failed and stayed in the 1950s. Number one, the flying carpet car. Look, father, no wheels. Use of a thin layer of compressed air may allow automobiles to hover and move just above the ground level. A pipe dream? Not at all. The concept, already proved, comes from scientist Andrew Kucha, vice president of engineering at one of America's major motor companies. His people are studying how to maintain stability. Special highway engineering is one way. Another is skillful design, evidenced already in experimental ideas from the staff of motor stylist George W. Walker. Today's earthbound cars won't turn into low-flying carpets right away, but it may just be around the corner. In 1958, you'd find no greater advocate for the hover car than Ford's vice president, Andrew A. Kutcher. Kucher is credited with having conceived the idea of the hover train in the 1930s, a precursor to today's maglev trains, which use magnets rather than compressed air to achieve a similar effect. Newspapers from 1958 describe a three-foot-long hover car model that was shown to reporters in Detroit. Riding on a cushion of air, Kucher described how this glide air car could one day achieve 200 to 500 miles per hour, since it didn't have tyres which burn up and lose traction or control. An Associated Press piece even quotes Kucher as saying that such technology would be in use in the foreseeable future. Well, hover cars may not be with us just yet, but Elon Musk's Hyperloop uses levitation technology, and the Japanese are developing a train that will use maglev technology. But they won't be available for another decade at least. OK, so the flying carpet car didn't quite make it into 2019. But how about the classroom of tomorrow? Classroom automation may foreshadow an end to school houses. Lessons would be televised to students going to school at home, where their work would be done and transmitted to a control centre for correction and grading. Dr Donald E. P. Smith of the University of Michigan believes teaching machines will appear in all classrooms before long. Typically, projects' questions will appear in one panel, then after an answer is written in a second panel, 
the right solution appears in still a third. Such machines are now intended for classrooms, but application of similar principles to education TV would make schoolhouses a thing of the past. What purpose does the classroom ultimately serve? It is simply an efficient place to herd a bunch of kids together so that they can listen to teachers and then get a response in person. But it's important to recognise that while this kind of techno-utopian solution to education was pushed hard in the 1950s and 60s, the ideas surrounding ubiquitous distance learning are nothing new. First, radio was going to let everybody learn from the comfort of their own home. Then television was supposed to radically alter the way that university classes were taught. Now the massive online open course movement, MOOC, is the distance learning technology of the decade. This idea was used to great effect in Australia, where there are over 1,000 master's degrees available online. With the distance between towns in Australia being so great, this has become an increasingly popular way of earning your degree. The problem I can see with this is how can everybody get to the student bar? Maybe this needs rethinking. So let's move on to closed circuit television, or CCTV. In the world of tomorrow, transistors and diodes will do more than squad cars to enforce the law. In fact, the day of the electronic policeman is already at hand. Television is now monitoring expressways in Detroit and reporting on ticket availability at Pennsylvania Station in New York. In the future, similar systems will help smash crime, using sunlight when available and infrared snooper rays the rest of the time. All findings will be transmitted automatically to police dispatch rooms, where one officer will see his entire precinct in a cluster of closed-circuit TV screens. Big Brother is watching you! You were warned back in 1949 by George Orwell. But is the government really keeping tabs on you with video cameras on every street corner? In many ways, the CCTV camera is a terribly inefficient device to monitor a population. Yes, they are handy after the fact, like in the case of the tragic bombing in London in 2005, or at the Boston Marathon in 2013. But if you really want to stop someone from doing something violent and horrendous, you need indications of what that person is going to do in the future. Cameras on every street corner may help identify patterns of behaviour, but they are obviously less valuable than monitoring electronic communication like emails, or instant messages, phone calls and texts. But that was certainly the surveillance future in 1960. The May 1960 edition of Sunday comic Closer Than We Think imagined the police station of tomorrow as a sort of always connected war room. The dispatch officer might have dozens of TV cameras in front of him, each showing different parts of a given city. A terrifying image of police overreach? Sure, but somehow less terrifying than our reality here in the 21st century. It's funny how quickly the imagery of what constitutes a total surveillance state can change. Security cameras aren't the symbol they once were. Of course, CCTV monitoring by police is still an issue for privacy advocates around the world. But no matter what the police and government surveillance initiatives of the future look like, the camera, all by its lonesome, will feel like a comically impotent symbol. The government may always be watching. It's just that now, know that it's not with a camera but with code. But what about vehicles, I hear you cry? No? Well, you should have. What about the electric car? This is from the March the 29th, 1959 Chicago Tribune. Americans soon may see the new kind of family second car, run by batteries, boasting a hot rod agility, and of adequate size and speed for limited distance use. Stinson Aircraft at San Diego and the Washington Auto Power Company, Spokane, have working models. A Detroit auto manufacturer also has a big project in this field. These electro cars will run about 70 miles between chargings, which can be done on any home socket. Also planned are roadway charges, similar to parking meters, which will give a fast charge for a quarter. With its transparent bubble top, dramatic curves and electric plug-in, not to mention those retro-licious white walled tyres, this was the automobile of the future. It was imagined not as a long-distance traveller, but as a kind of thing you'd zip around town in for quick trips to the supermarket, or maybe to the theatre, catching one of those hot new 3D movies. The electric car was far from new in 1959. 
In fact, a quarter of the registered vehicles built in the US at the turn of the 20th century were electric. But after gasoline engines established dominance in the 20th century, even the most conservative people were certain that gas wouldn't be dominant forever. The first half of the 20th century had seen tremendous change in how people got around, with everything from highways to air travel becoming mainstream realities in the US. So why wouldn't transportation continue to evolve in the latter half? Scientists promise that the 21st century will be filled with cheap, easy and fun electric cars. But with the likes of Tesla and others making such huge strides in the electric car market here in the 2010s, this vision of tomorrow may indeed be here. Staying on the automobile theme, self-driving cars. Traffic jams of tomorrow will become a lot more productive thanks to the amazing advances of 21st century technology. Technology that will allow us to be better workers. Right now, many of us suffer through long traffic played commutes to and from work, the airport or client meetings. It's just dead time when you aren't doing much. The day when we can play cards or take a nap while driving is closer than we think. The family of the future will be able to play board games or simply have a pleasant chat, since no one else has to keep an eye on the road. As father chooses the route in advance on a push-button selector, electronics take over the complete control. Progress can be accurately checked on a synchronised scanning map. With no driving responsibility, the family relaxes together. In 1959, designers were explicit about what the driverless car would afford us. More leisure. Disney also imagined a world of self-driving cars, with heavy emphasis on leisure. The May 1958 episode of the Disney TV series looked at the history and future of transportation, titled Magic Highway USA. The episodes last 10 minutes, including the fabulous future of driverless vehicles, complete with a game of checkers. Back in the 1950s and 60s, self-driving cars represented the fantastic life of luxury that was supposed to be just around the corner. But here in the 21st century, we can't even pretend that our driverless cars of the future will be filled with board games and light reading. Self-driving cars are being developed alongside electric cars, another thing predicted in the 1950s, although not many predicted the two together. In fact, it has been predicted that in, by 2030, all cars sold will be electric. So maybe the future is still just around the corner, but it's a corner that we can see with our sat-navs. But electric cars in 1950 were thought to be more solar-powered than battery-powered. In February 1957, James C. Zedder, then the Chrysler Vice President, predicted that in the years ahead solar-powered cars would be feasible, and that expanding knowledge of nuclear and solar energy would bring more abundant power to people everywhere. The automobile industry may be producing cars driven by solar power in the years ahead, James C. Zedder Chrysler Vice President predicted today. In an interview he said, We know how to get electrical energy from sunlight by means of silicon converters. If we continue to increase the efficiency of these converters, and if we are able to develop small efficient energy storage cells, solar-powered cars will be feasible. Zeta added that expanding knowledge of nuclear and solar energy is bringing into sight more abundant power for people everywhere. Tomorrow the Sunmobile may replace the automobile. The power of bottled sunshine will propel it. Your solar sedan will take energy from sun rays and store it in accumulators that will work like a battery. This power will drive your car just like gasoline does today. Well, there's another prediction that has yet to come true. These vehicles will only be good in sunny conditions, so the UK and North America is no good then. You're more likely to see these driving around the, the deserts of Saudi Arabia or even around the Nevada desert. But as soon as the sun disappears, so does your power. But what about home entertainment? How has that developed over the years? In 1958, the wall-to-wall -wall TV was predicted. The living room of the future was supposed to be uh, interactive. It was supposed to have all the world's media at your fingertips. And above all, it was supposed to have a big-ass TV. Today, people can buy enormous TVs relatively cheaply. But we're still waiting for this wall-to-wall -wall TV of the future from 1958. Tomorrow's worldwide television will bring you bullfights from Spain, exploration from Africa, and vacation reports from Tahiti. And in the giant-size wall-to-wall, if you wish. 
picture-thin screens will be made of tiny electroluminescent crystals and brand new development in electronics. They will replace the phosphor screen and electron gun of today's thick TV tube. According to E. W. Engstrom, a top industry executive, the compact circuitry for such a system may be built into a frame around the screen and the channel selector and picture adjustment controls may be contained within a small control box. It's that worldwide element that I'm still waiting on. Thanks to the complex web of international licensing agreements, we still seem so far away from having the world's media at our disposal. Despite the technology advances that the internet has brought, trying to get a news channel from overseas on a TV is very hard. For me to try and watch ABC News in Australia or NBC in America is damn near impossible. Yes, the world's media choices have become international in many ways, and YouTube has brought us many different things. But trying to watch content from other countries is very, very difficult, and I can't see a way of getting around that unless every country agrees. And of course, that will never happen. But what about the Electric Home Library? Some unusual inventions for home entertainment and education will be yours in the future such as the television recorder that RCA's David Sarnoff described recent with this device when a worthwhile program comes over the air while you are away from home or even while you're watching it you'll be able to preserve both the picture and sound on tape for replaying at any time. Westinghouse's Gwendolyn Price expects such tapes to reproduce shows in three dimensions and colour on screens as shallow as a picture. Another push-button development will be in projection of microfilm books on the ceiling or wall in large type to increase their impact on students. An electronic voice may accompany the visual passages. Well, this thing is sort of possible now. Small video projectors are here. Granted, in this day of 4K, 8K, however many K you want, it would be much better to have a full-size screen. But the price is just too expensive. Maybe we are living in the future of the 1950s. As for house cleaning robots, well, we have robotic vacuum cleaners. We have the ability to turn things on and off in the house without us even being in the house. So overall, I would say, yes, we are living in the future. The future of the 1950s. All in all, I'm pretty pleased to be living in the future. But I wonder what it would be like in another 10 years time. Highways in the sky. Flying cars? Star Trek style transportation? Thanks for listening to this month's UK Correspondent. I will now return you to Sean and Josh and the Rusted Robot Podcast. See you next month. Thank you, Paul. That was most informative. That was. Uh, yeah, some of, the, some of the things came true, so that's that's well, neat. The the last one of the last things he mentioned was the 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 recorder. Yeah, we've had VCRs and we got yeah. PVRs and DVRs and all that stuff, so that's cool. Um, what I want to know, actually, he was talking about the uh, the online learning master's degrees in Australia. Mm-hmm. Richard, can you let us know if you have a master's degree from an online source? Or is that like a, a real thing that people talk about? Or what is your take on that? Let us know. The rest of the robot at gmail.com. But I, I, I do want a flying car. I don't. No? People, have bad, had, people are having a hard enough time controlling their cars when they're on the ground. Oh, it had to be self-driving. Yeah, because... Uh... Self-driving electric flying car. We could make all the things all at once. Like, we couldn't control that. We, we'd have to have like a, a system in place... That would what I don't do understand works. is we are not like we all right, we got an idea to improve the cars, we're gonna make them electric and self driving. Why not just improve our freaking uh, mass transit systems? Like buses and trains? Yeah. If I wanna go to Toronto, yeah. I have two choices. I can take the bus, mm-hmm. which takes hours and hours and hours. Well, it's about an eight hour car ride. So with the bus, it's more like 14 because of all the little stops and all the little towns. Yeah. So 14 to 18, depending. Okay. Right? Yeah. Or I can take a plane, mm-hmm. both of which dump tons of pollution to the atmosphere. Yes. 
And, like, okay, the plane's not bad time-wise. Yeah, it's about an hour and a half. Yeah, but still. You could take a cab. I could take a cab. That would only rack me up a few hundred dollars. Yep. But getting, would... getting close to, like, a grand, too. Uh, yeah, maybe. But it'd be a nice ride with a cab driver. You could have a conversation. You could uh, take your wife with you. And you could have a built-in game of chess, just like Paul mentioned. Or no. che- checkers. He no. said checkers. You don't want to play checkers in the cab on the way to Toronto? I don't like sitting in a small space with a stranger for that long. Huh? All right, well, that's fair. Like, no, no insult to the cabbies, but uh-huh. you are a random person who picked up a random person. Odds are we do not have anything in common. Ah, uh, you're both alive, and you're both going to Toronto. He's going to Toronto because I'm going to Toronto. Uh huh. Not because he wants to go to Toronto. True enough. Oh, hey. Speaking of cab drivers, yesterday my brother Robin, he got his cab driver's license. He's going to be a cabbie. He's going to be a cabbie. Okay. Yeah, because he's been working part-time at Value Village, and... Uh, he hates it. Um, it's fine, but whatever, I guess. And uh, uh, he works uh, security at the bars on the weekends, so he's doing a couple piddly part-time jobs, and I think he wants to, like, you know, make some real money. And he likes driving. And he would probably work the night shift, and he's a night owl, so... Okay. Maybe he could take you to Toronto. <sighs> and then he wouldn't be a stranger, per se. Well, I... Why are you going to Toronto, anyway? I'm using it as an example. Oh, you're not actually wanting to go. No. Okay. But, like, our local mass transit system is terrible. Mm-hmm. Our regional mass transit system is non-existent. Because we used to have a train from Timmins to wherever, but Mm -hmm. that doesn't exist anymore. They removed it. Yes, years ago. Because they didn't want a train here anymore for some reason. For some reason. Yeah. I don't know why. You look at Japan. They got... Trains everywhere. They got high-speed rail across the entire country. As you should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're like... They're a tiny little island. They're living in the future. Well, yes. Mm -hmm. Why, Why do we have such a terrible mass transit? I don't have the answers. You should run for mayor. I did. Well, sort of. I did. put my name in, but I removed it once more people joined. Oh. You should do it for real this time. Maybe. I think so. I'll Maybe. be your, I'll be your uh, your running mate? That's not a thing. Not No, not <laughs> in our local election. There is no vice mayor in Timmins. That's too bad. There should be. Uh, but yeah, no. That's the thing I'd like to see, is improved mass transit systems. Yes. Get me a, a, a Hyperloop. Get me... Maglev trains. Get me a space elevator. How about a transporter? Uh, no, because then you are dead. Yeah, but you'll be alive again. No, a copy of you will be alive. It's just as good. You won't know the difference. No, yes, you you will. Nobody else will. Then it's fine. It's fine, Josh. It's no, okay. continuity of self, Sean. Continuity of self. Maybe you'd be somebody better. No, it'll be an exact copy of you. So it'll be just as bad as it is oh, now. Oh, man. But you won't be around anymore. That's okay. I've been meaning to take a vacation. <laughs> That's not funny, because I just did. <laughs> so, anyways. Yeah, we definitely need some vast improvements. And I, I love getting our uh, history of the future from, from Paul. It's. Uh... I enjoy a lot of the crazy ideas they thought were coming. Mm-hmm. And particularly, like, the far future stuff. Yeah. Like, the 1950s space opera stuff is crazy. Totally. Um, what's the one that I recently listened to? The Uplift series. What's that about? Uh, it's a... So, in galactic terms, no race has evolved on its own to be up, uh, to be sentient. Oh, and you needed help. Everybody was uplifted by somebody else. Huh, okay. Except for humanity. Nobody can find who uplifted humanity. Ah, now, normally a race would just take us on under their wing, because when you uplift a race, mm-hmm. in the galactic laws, everybody everybody in that race that you uplifted spends 10,000 years serving your race. Okay. And then off they go. Hmm. But nobody uplifted humanity. But the only reason humanity isn't subsumed by other people, because we uplifted three races. Uh. Chimpanzees, dolphins, and gorillas. Okay. So, it's an interesting series... But, like, it was written 50s, 60s, and oh. they got some weird ideas about, like, things that are going to, the way things work out. And is this an audio drama that you discovered? It's, an, it's a book series. Oh, okay. The Uplift series. Okay. 
Huh. It's, uh, it's interesting. Sounds it's like it. Fat. Sounds like something I would read. You should check it out. The Uplift series. Yeah. Okay. There's like 13 books in the series. Holy jeez. Yeah, yeah, it's a big series. Do you know who wrote it? You can remember offhand? I cannot, but if you pause the thing... Hi, my name's Robert J. Sawyer. I'm an award-winning science fiction writer, and you're listening to the Rusted Robot Podcast. Don't forget to follow them on Twitter. Well, it's not even as far back as I thought it was. Oh, no? No. Only in the 1980s. Oh. But uh, it's by David Brin. I've heard of him. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an interesting series. I, I recommend it to anybody. Okay. Um... Hmm. Paul. Oh, shameless podcast plug. A shameless plug. Right. Soul Forge podcast. Jump City Comic Books. Check out Jump City Comic Books for your latest comics and collectibles at Thirty Eight Pine Street North in the One Hundred One Mall, and then go and listen to the Soul Forge podcast. Hey, it's Sean from the Soul Forge podcast. Join me and the gang as we guide you through the adventures of living. Topics include sex, loss, joy, and stupid things we've done for love. It's life, the universe, and everything. Find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the ESO Network, SoulForgePodcast.com, and everywhere else you find podcasts. The Soul Forge Podcast. Let's find out together. It's where you can hear my melodic tones about other things that are not geeky. Yeah. So this is... This is a quiet week. I don't know where else to go with this. Well, we're uh, currently, timer-wise, we're at uh, 34 minutes, but Paul's thing is about 17. Uh, so that brings us to what? What's 33 and 17? 50. Okay. And then we have no trailers, but we do have end credits, uh, a promo for another podcast here on the ESO Network, plus our opening theme. But there's nothing else going on, Josh. I know, it's quiet. I know, we talked about The Wandering Earth for about ten minutes. Hello, I'm Daniel Peter Hitch, author of the Bubbles the Pirate children's book series and the Connected Worlds Chronicles. You're listening to the Soul Forge podcast. Keep forging your soul. But, oh, Jessica Jones is uh, out now. The the last of the... uh... Marvel. Uh, the Netflix Marvel shows. Yes, season three just arrived yesterday. I haven't started. So, what, four days until it's cancelled? Well, they've already confirmed it was cancelled months ago. Did they? I thought they were waiting until it came out to oh, confirm oh, it was no. cancelled. They confirmed everything's cancelled even before it came out. It's just, they were in production of it, now here it is. And One day we'll actually get around to watching it. What do you think? Does it end in a cliffhanger? <sighs> I would not be surprised, actually. Because that would be funny? That would be hilarious. A terrible, terrifying cliffhanger, and then that's it, we're done? Yeah. Okay. That's how I would do it. Yeah, that, that's kind of how I would do it, too. That's how Dad did it. Tell, Let's try. Tell yeah. America does it. No. no. It's worked out pretty well so far. No. No? No, we're not doing this. Why not? No. Okay. Uh, you said you and your wife, the proprietor of Jump City Comics, has been watching uh, Lucifer on Netflix. We have. We're uh, almost done season four. Okay. So we're just we're halfway through the last season. Uh-huh. I'm not going to spoil anything for anybody. It's a really good show. Good, because I'm only halfway through the first season. What? Yeah. Come on. Uh, yeah, How yeah. long have you been watching it? Uh, I just discovered it a few months back. Okay, an episode a day? Uh, no, I haven't. I go long periods without watching anything. An episode a day? I could do that. I probably would do two or three, but I just... I don't know. No? Yeah. Whatever. Sitting quiet now? Yeah, that's it. You sit quietly in your living room, just staring at the wall? Rocking back and forth, eating my hair. Huh. That's why I have none left. It's very sad. Uh, but no, but they did confirm that uh, Netflix is going to have a season five of Lucifer. Yes. So that's cool. Uh, d- but that's it. That's it. That, that's they're, it. They're ending the series with that. Yeah. So. But I, but the ten or twelve episodes that I've seen so far, I really like. Well, you, so. it gets better. Oh, I believe it does. There's a bit of a lull in late season three, but okay. No. Yeah, season three. Mid-season three, there's a bit of a lull. Okay. The whole uh, Kane thing. Ah, oh, I don't know. Yeah. But I'm looking forward to it. So I had to get on it. And I, the, Netflix has added a bunch of new stuff, and so it's hard to watch everything. And so I kind of just go and read books and stuff. But uh, got to get back into it. It's exciting. Is there anything else to talk about? I think that's it. I think that's it. I think that's the end. Uh, should we talk about um, other things to do with number 47? 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. 47. Because this is episode 247 and 47 is the Star Trek number. 
Is there any other Star Trek stuff you want to talk about? Are you looking forward to Season 3 of Discovery? No. Are you looking forward to the Picard series? Maybe. Okay. Uh, what about the cartoons that are coming out? Maybe. Okay. Are they going to be on Netflix? Uh, no. Well, uh, they're going to be on CBS All Access? Um, probably. Uh, I know one of the cartoons is going to be on Nickelodeon. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know when they're coming out. Yeah. Sometime. Eventually. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, that's it. That's the end of our podcast. If you'd like to rate and review us in the iTunes store or whatever they're calling it these days, that would be awesome. Uh, all the uh, hosting fees are coming up. So if you'd like to PayPal donation us, uh, the rusted robot at gmail.com, send us money, send us reviews, send us more listeners. We could definitely use those. Um, I didn't think we'd be living in the great filter, but here we are killing it, Josh. It's very exciting. So that could be a whole other podcast. Okay. Do you have any other closing thoughts or words? Nope. I'm I'm pretty much out of inspirational things to say today. You're out of things to say. All right. Well, that's the end of our show for this week. Next week will be more exciting. And hopefully. Un- hopefully. And until next time, listeners, remember, Tetris taught me that when you try to fit in, you'll disappear. You have been listening to the Rusted Robot Podcast. To contact the show, email therustedrobot at gmail.com or tweet us at therustedrobot. Join the Facebook page and group and visit the website at therustedrobot.podbean.com. The Rusted Robot podcast was put together by Sean and Josh and the Rusty Crew. Please remember to check out our other show, the Soul Forge podcast, visit Jump City Comics in the 101 Mall, and leave a glowing review in your chosen podcast app. Thank you, and have a geeky day. The Rusted Robot podcast. Think about it. has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon 
or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Thank you.